family. It's nice to talk with you again. It's been an eventful week as the governor has issued his stay-at-home order. And I'm thankful for this digital medium that allows us to open the Word of God together and to discover who he is and how he would have us to live in real life. We have much to be grateful for. As I looked yesterday out my office window, I could see the firemen next door training outside as a group running around the firehouse doing calisthenics pulling hoses it was a reassuring sight thank you to the first responders to our police thank you to the medical community who gives of themselves at risk to themselves uh, for our good and, and for helping other people we have many in our community to thank for the good that they do, but most of all, we have our good and gracious God to thank. He reigns on high. He loves us more than we could ever imagine. He gave his own son, Jesus Christ, to become like us, live our life, die our death, raise to life so that we have real life right now with God because of Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how do we live in uncertain times? How do we live real life in a raw environment like this one? We don't have to be passive. We can take concrete actions that will help us live the life he envisions for us right here, right now. Let's open our Bibles to the book of James. We're going to start in chapter 1. We want to spring into action. We would like to step out in faith and obedience to who Jesus is. And I want to share five ways that we can take concrete actions in our life right now that would live and love in real time uh, for the God of the Bible and His Son, Jesus Christ. The first way we can spring into action, the first way we can really live is this, that we can rejoice. We can rejoice at the maturity and resolve that God is working in us. And that's from James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Beginning in verse 1, it says this, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. James is the half-brother of Jesus. He is self-described as a bondservant of God and 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to a group of people, to Jewish believers who are scattered around the Roman Empire, scattered probably by the persecution of the early church in, in Acts chapter 11. And so they're separated from one another, separated from one another. James writes these life-giving words to how they can live for Christ in real time right now. In the first century, believers had a target on their back and they experienced some extraordinary trials, difficulties and sufferings. And so James addresses their present circumstances and he says in verse two, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Well, how does the word joy and the word suffering fit in the same sentence? Especially how does it fit in the, in the same moment, in, in the same life? It's in the form of a command to consider it all joy when you encounter trials. Not that we consider the joy at the trial, but in spite of the trial, in the person of Jesus Christ. Joy is not our natural reaction to hardship and to suffering. It, it is a gift that comes in and through God. It's different than giddy. It's different than happy. It's not at all dependent on circumstances, but it is a settled trust and conviction, a hope, all of that mingled together in the heart that knows that God is in control and that he's up to something and he's up to something in my life so that we can fold into who he is. And he gives us the reason for the joy in verse three, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Testing is is to prove. It's to show that our faith is legit and our faith is in a person. Our faith is in the Jesus Christ who died and the Jesus Christ who is raised from the dead. And so that as we say yes to him in spite of adversity and difficulties that may tempt us to doubt God's goodness, that may tempt us to rely on our own resources to solve solutions and problems that only God can address. So this is a faith in Jesus Christ, and this is a faith that produces maturity and endurance, and endurance has a result, and that's in verse four, let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In short, trials are a teachable moment. They're a new and fresh opportunity for us to trust God in the moment for what God can teach us in shaping us to be more like Jesus Christ. But you can put it in the bank. We can trust it that we're going to lack wisdom when we're in trials. Wisdom is the practical application of God's truth. So God has told us to love your neighbor. Well, what does it look like to love your neighbor in a COVID-19 world? What does it look like to practice hospitality and generosity and How can we identify a person in need? That's wisdom. So what are those practical steps to live out the truth that God reveals to us? We're going to lack wisdom. And when we lack wisdom, we're to ask of God. So we pray, and that's in verse five and six. If any of you lacks wisdom, and it's assumed that we will, then let him or her ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. When we lack wisdom, we ask of God. God is a generous God. He gives freely to his people all that we need to live out his word and his purposes. But we are to ask in faith, and that faith is connected to a person. The faith is connected to God and to ask expectantly in confidence without doubting. The doubting is a disdain for the goodness of God. The doubting pulls us away from this confident, rock solid foundation in the grace and the kindness and the mercy and goodness of God. And when we disdain the goodness of God, and we don't believe God's going to provide all that we need in that moment, it creates an internal storm of hurricane force. It creates a storm that's here described as the surf of the sea. 
that's at the mercy of the currents and the wind. It's an internal foment and turmoil that leads to verse 7, for that man, the one who disdains and doubts God and the goodness of God, ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Literally, a two-souled person. And a two-souled person, a divided person in this case, would be a person who says they love God and they believe in his son, Jesus Christ, but they trust in themselves more than trusting in God or they trust in the ways of the world, or in their own abilities and skill sets, and quickly find out that the circumstances that they're in, and the suffering, and the trial, and the hardship is, is much greater than their own internal reservoir apart from Christ. But in Christ, we can truly, rightly ask of God for His wisdom and how we can live out the commands of God. So now, as we're confined in our homes, what does it look like for a child to obey their parents? What does it look like for a husband to love his wife and a wife to love her husband? What does it look like to reach out to the widows and to those who are single and to the widowers? That's God's wisdom for living out and inhabiting God's will. So we can rightfully, right now, ask God for wisdom and we can trust God to give us that wisdom and in the giving of the wisdom as we obey his word, he creates and reshapes us, making us increasingly like his son, Jesus Christ. So a first practical step that we can take is that we can rejoice at the maturity and the internal resolve, that endurance that God is working in us. And as we say yes to the God of the Bible, we become who he envisioned, loving and living, just like he said. There is a second practical action that we can take in this moment to really live right now, all out, for Jesus Christ. And that second practical action is we can sustain our soul by engaging and embracing the Word of God. We find that in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, tracking through verse 25. I'm a news junkie. I like to read the news. I like to understand how other people think and how they might think differently than do I and what their worldview is and how that influences their words and their daily choices. So I like to read the news and in a way it's, it's addicting. But when we read the news, it costs us something. And we can't subsist on a diet of books, news, novels, movies. It's only the Word of God that truly sustains the soul. It's only the Word of God that cuts through the layers of our broken humanity, addressing some of our strongest negative impulses and sin choices. And that's what we find in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. This you know, my beloved brothers and sisters, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. The person who is quick to hear is the person who listens. The person who has a right understanding of themselves and can lock it down, lock down the tongue long enough to hear the thoughts and the intentions of the other person so that we can be better informed about who they are and then we know when it's time to speak. So that there is a timeliness to our words, a, a careful choosing of our words. And then slow to anger. And he tells us why be slow to anger, and that is because anger is mostly a destructive influence. At least it is when wielded in our arsenal. So we find in verse 20, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God so that you and I would so manage our emotions that we might use in a, in a way that is unhelpful or perhaps even hurtful to another person. 
And that is also an element of trusting God because God is the one who is truly righteous and God is the one who truly works so that we would speak and love each other in ways that are right and true of how God loves us. Then we see the word of God cutting through more negative layers in verse 21 and then it turns positive. Therefore putting aside all filthiness, that means all impurities. That means everything that is not of God. And stuck at home in a digital world, there's no end of opportunity to really engage in viewing and actions and behaviors that, that really are hurtful to us and hurtful to other people. And so let's set aside all that is not of God and, and wrap our heart and our mind around the Word of God, that we would receive the Word of God, which is able to save our soul. The Word of God is like a seed that embeds in the fertile soil of the human heart. And it's the word of God that nourishes the soul. Jesus Christ is the full and complete expression of the word of God. We worship Jesus, who is word of God. The Bible is not Jesus, but the Bible is the word of God. And when we respond to God's word, we're responding to God himself who speaks to us through his word. When a mother tells a child to do something, and the child does it, the child has obeyed not only the word of the mom, but the child has obeyed the mother herself. So it's a personal relationship and it's a right heart response to somebody that we know God entrusted us to their care, and we know that we need to respond rightly to our parent in, in that moment because of who they are and, and what God has to say. So it is with us. When we pick up the Word of God and we engage the Word of God rightly and truly, and we say yes in obedience and living out His Word, we're responding to a person. We're responding to the God of the Bible, the God who gave His Son, we're responding to Jesus himself, who said, if you love me, you'll do what I command. You'll do what I say. The word of God reminds us who God is, and reminds us who we are. And when we receive this nourishing truth from God, it says here that the person who engages intently the law of liberty, which is the gospel, and the person who lives out the word of God and the gospel of God, this, this law of liberty is blessed in what they do. And that includes the, the true and genuine satisfaction of loving and living right now in obedience to God. This last week I was listening to one of my favorite sports talk radio shows. And the host is really quite well known and he was interviewing one of the most famous football players of, of all time. And the host asked the football player, in the context of COVID-19, what advice would you have for us today? And the football player, former player, he answered, read Psalm 23. And the host hesitated and said, Psalm 23? And the player said, yes. It's in the Bible. And the host said, I guess I'll have to find one of those. I hope he does. I hope people send him Bibles. I hope he picks them up. I hope he starts in John chapter 1. I hope he reads the Gospel of John, discovers the goodness and the grace and the kindness of God in giving us his son, Jesus Christ. Our God is a good God who gives us all we need in the way of wisdom right now. And he gives us his word. He reveals to us who he is so that we can respond from the heart to him. A third action step that we can take right here, right now to really live is, is, is that we can grow in the wisdom of God that results in righteousness and peace. Check out James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. If we are truly wise, then our lives will show it. Wisdom is as wisdom does. Chapter 3, verse 13. 
who among you is wise and understanding, let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. Gentleness is just such a great virtue. It's a great quality. It describes a person who is strong, but that strength is managed by the Spirit of God. That strength yields and submits to the Jesus that we know and love. So that we would be gentle one with another. It's the choice of the truly wise. And then James contrasts two very different kinds of wisdom. One kind of wisdom is the wisdom of the world, pushes back against the truth, and it causes a chaos and an unraveling within a person and between people. Look at verses 14 to 16. But you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart. Do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. To turn away from the Word of God is to buy into a kind of wisdom that messages a way of doing life that just draws us further and further away from God. There is a wisdom that God gives that is accessible to us, and it's described in one of the most powerful passages in the book of James. Verse 17 and 18, the wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy, And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The wisdom from above is is first pure in that it's unstained. It's without blemish or blame. The wisdom of God is not sort of good or it's not half bad. It is innocent and it is right and it comes only from God. It is innocent, it is right, and it is God-given. Then it's peaceable. Peace is God's idea. God likes peace, not appeasement or not unhealthy avoidance of an important issue. God says, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with each other. And the wisdom from above is peaceable. The wisdom from above is also gentle and reasonable. Gentleness is repeated yet again. Reasonableness is just what we would think it is, and that is a willingness to be persuaded by God or by another, as if maybe this other person knows what they're talking about. In fact, maybe I'm not as wise as they are in the moment. This wisdom from above is is full of mercy. Mercy withholds from another people what they might deserve in the moment. If there are people in your world that are merciful to you, may their tribe increase. And may you also be to them merciful in what we say and what we do. This wisdom from above is full of God's fruit, good fruit, so that our behavioral actions right now result in a harvest that we want to eat. We like the result. And then God's wisdom is unwavering. In other words, it's consistently wise and his wisdom is unpretentious. It's authentic. It's real. And the wisdom from above brings results and those results are in James chapter 3, verse 18. I read it again. The seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So the peace is a habitat of wherever we live and wherever we are. That in that habitat, we would relate to one another in a way that is peaceable and that yields a result of of righteousness. And righteousness is what God says about who he is and, and what God says about who we are and how to live in this moment. And it's this kind of wisdom that God offers to us that is accessible to us. 
So let's receive his wisdom and let's run with it. There's a fourth action step we can take right now in this moment, and that is that we can trust God with our plans for tomorrow and do the next right thing today. James chapter 4, if you would turn to verse 13, James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. Some of you are, are gifted thinkers. Your superpower is maybe strategic thinking, or maybe you're productive, you make things happen, you, you get results. Others of you are leaders who are trying to anticipate where COVID-19 is going and how that not only impacts the greater economy, but how it affects your niche, your place in the world, and you're realigning resources. You're trying to anticipate where the state of Washington will be in, in June or July of 2020 or next year and beyond, and you're making action steps, you're making plans, you're trying to get ahead of it, trying to anticipate what's next. All of us in this moment, and trying to anticipate the future and make our plans, it'll be helpful for us to engage James chapter 4, 13 through 17. James chapter 4, verse 13, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. What James is talking about is those who plan for tomorrow independently of God, resting in our own abilities and our own skill sets without giving consideration to who God is and that he is the sovereign God, which means that in being sovereign that he is only accountable to himself, that he is gracious and sovereign, and that he accomplishes and affects his will so that our plans are just our plans. Let's plan wisely, let's anticipate, let's take concrete actions and steps that are wise. Let's ask God for wisdom. And then let's step toward him in, in making those plans, but remembering that whatever we do, and in all we do, above all that we would yield to his will, in trusting him, the God who is sovereign and who is on the throne and the God who loves us and who always affects good for us. We don't know about tomorrow. We do know that God rules and God wills. But we do know about today. And what we know of who God is today, what we know of God's word right now in our present circumstances is what verse 17 is about. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So as we look to the future and we look to the unknown, let's plan, let's plan wisely for tomorrow. But let's also seize today, the opportunity today, to evaluate who we are and what is the next right thing. What is a concrete action of obedience and love to the God of the Bible that reflects this wisdom of God that is sown in peace, that we would trust his sovereign grace and goodness and that we would follow him right now in this moment, doing what we know would please him. The fifth action step is in James chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, and it's this, that we can pray for each other and humbly confess our own sin. I want to read James chapter 5, 13 through 16, and then walk our way back through it. Let's understand what it does say and what it doesn't say. And then let's take away the practical application that we can from this passage. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he or she must pray. Is anyone cheerful? then he or she is to sing praises. 
So you have two very different experiences. You have two very different responses, but both responses are to the same person. So if anyone is suffering, then they must pray and not stop praying. They should keep praying. And then in verse 13, it, it, is anyone cheerful? Then that person is to start singing and to keep singing. We can do that in our homes. We can do that for each other. We can do that wherever we are right now. Then check out verse 14. It says, Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So that if there's a person who is sick, then connecting with the spiritual leaders of the church is God's idea. And so the spiritual leaders, in this case the elders of the church, they anoint with oil, and the oil is symbolic of this person being set aside to be prayed for. So the elders are to pray for the person who is sick. And then the very next verse, it says, verse 15, the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Let's pray expectantly. Sometimes, especially early on in, in my life, I prayed with a sense of whatever will be, will be. Uh, almost a, a resignation. Almost a not expecting God to intervene and, and to take action. So we have one extreme where we are resigned to whatever is. And then we have another extreme where we presume that God is on demand and that God is going to do what our will is and what we insist. Here we have the, the practical action that we would pray expectantly. But knowing even as we pray expectantly that sin and disease are an affliction of all of us. And that there are all kinds of times in the Bible when people are sick or people are suffering, and it's, it's not occasioned by anything that they did or any action that they took. So we don't need to try to think back through if we're sick, what sort of secret sin have I done that I, I need to deal with in, in, order to, in order for God to hear my prayer. That's, that's not what he's saying here. What God is saying is that we want to pray. We want to pray expectantly, but we want to pray just like we did in James chapter 1. Trusting him for wisdom, trusting him for his will, so that we can obey him in the moment, just like we just saw in James chapter 4, that in this moment we can trust the Lord with our future, and that we would be honest about our sin, that we would, verse 16, confess our sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. If we're a follower of Jesus Christ, then we're a part of a community of people who care for the physical and spiritual well-being of others without elevating ourselves up above the other. So the practical action that we can take is that we would pray for others in the body, that we would be honest with God about our own sin, admitting our stuff as sin, and that we would be a part of a community that we're, we could admit to others, we could confess our sin and our wrong to others, stepping toward them because the temptation is when we sin to keep it a secret and to pull back from others with whom we are to be in community. So the temptation is to guard our sin and to hide our sin. But here we can see how helpful it is for us to be in relationship with another, with another human being, with another person, where we could rightfully and appropriately admit, confess our sin to them with an attitude of humility. So let's pray for one another. We can pray for others in our life group, those who are in leadership or on staff. We can connect in an online digital community with some of our ministry leaders and some of the classes that we're providing. You can email the church uh, website. You can 
call the church number next Tuesday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. If you call the main number at the church office, that will immediately go to one of our staff so that we can pray with you and encourage you and, and help give you direction for today and connect you with others for tomorrow. In my office is one of my all-time favorite photos of one of my all-time favorite people. It's a photo of my grandfather at work in his blacksmith shop. He is, he's making the head of a pick, you know, the tool that you use to swing and break up dirt and rocks. He made the head of this pick out of a piece of steel, and he had put it into a forge, and then he began to heat up the piece of steel, took it out and put it on a machine called a trip hammer, and he began to reshape this, just this steel bar. And he began to shape it into a tool. And to do that, he would put it in the forge and he would heat it to the right temperature so that it would yield to the hammer and it would yield to his will and to his intent. And then he would put it back into the forge and heat it up again. But if he heated the steel too much, it would just dissolve. It would just melt and you lost a perfectly good instrument. So my grandfather, in his master hand, he could make these tools that were useful to others. He knew the amount of heat it would take to reshape something that was so stubborn and resistant in a far greater way. Our God is sovereign in his grace and in his goodness. He, he resources us in life for whatever his intent and his purpose and his will so that, that we can trust him, even in the midst of suffering even in the midst of hardship that we would never invite and we would never want. But he uses that difficult experience in the lives of those who trust him, who say yes to his son, Jesus Christ, who say yes in obedience to him because we love the Father, we trust him, we trust his goodness, we trust all there is about him, giving our life, and he shapes us, he recreates us, so that at the end of the day, the one who says yes to Jesus is more like Jesus than we were when we began the day. So it is with our good and gracious Heavenly Father. He is sovereign. He is gracious. He gives us wisdom. He gives us strength. He shows us His word. He shows us His will for His glory and our good. So let's give ourselves to the Father. Let's trust God with all that we have with all that we are, and with all that we do. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven. My joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will say, I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me, through the deepest valley He will lead. Oh, the night.
No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow. Say. 